Let's go to the book of Revelation and find Revelation chapter 3. And I'll invite you to stand with us and we're going to read, we'll read two verses and one of them will be our text. Revelation chapter 3. Give you just a moment to get there. Now if you're having trouble finding Revelation, you really need to be here at the 9 and the 11 and the thir- and Thursday night and online and do a little Bible study yourself at home. Say amen right there. It's the last book of your Bible. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 1, and we're going to read verse 2, and then I'll pray, and I want to walk through verse 1, and then give you the text in verse 2. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. This is my text. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Lord, I pray that you would take my mouth and anoint it, put a shield over my mind, and put a hedge, Father, around my words that I would say only that which pleases and glorifies you. May I not speak what is on my heart or my mind, but may I convey to your sheep this morning the message that is on your heart. Lord, use us now and I will give you glory, knowing that in me there dwelleth no good thing. And if anything happens today profitable and eternal, it will be on behalf of the Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God. So please do that work. And it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We are in the book of Revelation chapter 3. And I want to preach verse 2, but I want to walk through verse 1. I have noticed on social media that there is a lot of attention being given to the book of Revelation. And I've really been wanting to preach out of Revelation prophetically, but I'm waiting on a green light from the Lord to do so. But it is important that if you read Revelation, or if you see people posting verses out of Revelation, You must understand the context and the writing style of the book of Revelation. It is written in metaphors. It is written in pictures and it is written in types. And if you do not understand that, you can easily grab a verse and before you know it, you've gone a hundred miles in the wrong direction doing a hundred mile an hour. You must understand that the Word of God, you just don't go grab something out of it. You have to study and understand the context around it. And now every one of you can do that. That's not preacher stuff, that's Christian stuff. There's nothing in that book that God will tell me that He won't tell you. And so you get in there and study. But Revelation is written in typology. For instance, in verse 1, This is Jesus speaking. I've got a red letter Bible this morning and that whole page is red. That is the words of Christ. Jesus said in verse one, unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right. Now here's some of that typology. The angel here is a word, angel is a word for messenger. This means angel represents the pastor of that local church. I am an angel. Now see, y'all laughing about that is very hurtful. And I've tried to tell Miss Amy that for years. She don't believe the Bible. Y'all pray for her. (laughs) Under the angel, that's the pastor, the messenger. So under the messenger of the church in Sardis, now the church in Sardis, Sardis was a village, it was a town. It would be like saying the church in Catala. 
It, it is speaking in reference to the people of God that assembled at that place and they were a local body of believers just like we are and they were located in Sardis. And he said, write these things that he that hath the seven spirits of God has said this. Now understand, God does not have seven different spirits. The the number seven in your Bible represents completeness, wholeness, or perfection. That's why there's seven days in a week. It is a complete cycle. So when Jesus refers to the seven, capital S, spirits of God, it is not seven different spirits, but it is saying God, who has all of the Holy Spirit, is the one saying this. And then he goes on to say, and the seven stars, that's also a reference to the pastor, I'm an angel and a star. This sermon is really good for my self-esteem. I may print this verse out and carry it around this week. So he said, you tell the pastor of the church at Sardis, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, but he said, truthfully, you're dead. And then he says in verse two, be watchful. And here is the heart of my message today. He said, and strengthen the things which remain. I want you to say those four words with me, good and loud, the things which remain. Everybody, the things which remain. When Jesus spoke to the church of Sardis. He said, you have lost a lot of things. You have squandered a lot of blessings. You have lost the fire of God that once burned in your church. You have lost the zeal of the Lord that once shone brightly in your walk with God. He said, you are a dying church. And I guess if we could put it in modern day vernacular, what he said is, you're on life support right now. You barely have a spiritual heartbeat. I mean, you're barely breathing spiritually. Everybody thinks that you're alive, but I know that you are dying and that you are dead spiritually. And then he says in verse two, you are dying, but you're not dead yet. You're not doing as good as you once did, but you're still doing. And so I want you to focus on what you have, not what you have not. I want you to regain your breath. I want your heart rate to increase. I want the blood flow to come back to the body of Christ. And I want you to take what is left and I want you to do your best to revive it, to resurrect it, and let God bless what is left. I think the message in Revelation 3 is one that easily applies to our lives today. We need to strengthen that which remains. I'm going to need an amen right here. You can be so caught up with what you have lost that you lose sight of what you still have. There are a lot of people in here this morning that are at the beginning of their life. They've not really tasted heartache. They've not really been down deep in discouragement and life is still in front of you, and I say to everyone that is there, especially these young people, we are cheering for you. We are praying for you. It is our prayer as your parents and as your pastor and as your elders. It is our prayer that much of the suffering we have gone through that you never have to taste it. How many of you are praying that for the younger generation? 
Listen to me. You don't have to go through everything we went through. Get that negativity out of your mind. If you follow God, if you stay close to him, keep your nose in the Bible, keep your heart clean and your feet going in the right direction, you can bypass a lot of trouble that some of us spent way too long dealing with. So stay on, stay in church, stay on fire. But for those of us that are here this morning that have lost some things. And for those of us that experience loss on many different levels, it is imperative that we learn and that we embrace and operate with this perspective that I may not be able to get back what I had. Oh, I am preaching this morning. But I can focus on what I still have. Do not spend your life looking back at what was, but rather give all you've got to what still is. There is so many things in life that will fall, they will fail, they will crumble, and if you're not careful, you will get stuck looking in the rear view mirror while there is a windshield all around you that is trying to carry you forward, we can get caught up looking back at what used to be. When I begin to think about the idea of strengthening the things which remain, I was reminded that our Bible is full of people who thought they had lost it all, but when they looked a little closer, hallelujah, they found out they had a little something left. Naomi in the book of Ruth was the first character that came to my mind. Naomi had a husband by the name of Elimelech. There was a famine in their country and so they went to Moab to run from the famine. When they got to Moab, Elimelech died in Moab. Her two sons Malon and Chilion. They married and shortly after they married, both of her sons died in the land of Moab. Now she has three graves that carry her last name. She has two daughter-in-laws. and She looks at them and says, I don't know what I'm going to do. And one of them by the name of Orpah spoke up and said, well, whatever you do, you're doing it without me because I don't see a future with you. There's nothing you can do for me. I'm going back to where I came from. Naomi lost her husband. She lost two boys and a daughter-in-law that walked away and she was down to nothing. But friend, when we get down to nothing, If you'll look around, God has always left you something. There was one left, her daughter-in-law by the name of Ruth. And Naomi could have sat down and grieved her life away in Moab and said, my husband's gone, my boys are dead, my daughter-in-law left me, there's nobody here but me and Ruth. God is through with me. Life has passed me by. But praise God, she got up out of the ashes, she dusted off herself, and she got what she had, and she made a choice to carry on with what was left. Her and Ruth went back to their homeland, and when they got back home, Ruth was out one day picking up leftovers in a cornfield. The Bible says, that a man by the name of Boaz saw her. And Boaz was tall, dark, handsome, and rich. Somebody else shout right there. And if I see any of these ladies hanging out in a cornfield this week, I'll know they're looking for God's will. Amen. She runs across Boaz, and Boaz falls in love with Ruth. He marries Ruth. And now Naomi, glory, I'm having a good time this morning. Naomi, who had lost it all except for a daughter-in-law, has now got a daughter-in-law, a new son who is wealthy. And then Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, and her new son, Boaz, 
They have a little baby. And now a woman that could have quit, are y'all hearing me this morning? A woman that could have sat down and said it's over, I've got nothing left. Now she's got a wealthy son-in-law, she's got a beautiful daughter-in-law, and she's holding a brand new grandbaby in her arms. The story does not end there. That little boy's name was Obed. Obed grew up and he had a son named Jesse. Jesse grew up and he had a son named David. Have y'all ever heard of him? David wrote 75 of the Psalms in your Bible. Six books of the Bible contain the life and history of David. His name is referenced in 20 other books of the Bible. And the reason that we have David and the reason our Bible is filled with his story is because a woman named Naomi could have sat down and quit when everything left. But praise God, she strengthened that which remained. It would have been so easy to say, well, we had a good run and prop up by the gravestone of Elimelech and look back on what could have been. But thank God she had something left. And when she took what she had, God blessed it and gave her more than she could ever dream of. Oh, I praise the Lord that if we will take what we have and if we will invest in it and if we will strengthen it and if we will rejoice in it and if we'll be thankful for it, God can take that which is left and he can bring more out of what is left than that which we lost. I think about 2 Kings chapter 4. Elisha, the man of God, comes down and he goes to the house of a widow woman. When he comes to her home, she says to the man of God, my husband is dead and I'm a widow. And she said he left us in such bad financial shape that I've got two sons and the creditors are coming to take our boys into slavery because we cannot pay our debt. Now that was a principle that was used in Bible times. If you couldn't pay your debt, they'd take one of your children in exchange for the debt and you'd be debt free. How many of you wish that was still an option today? <laughs> Y'all don't look at me so spiritual. You know you've got one you trade in for, to be debt free. There'd been a few days, Dalton, he'd just be out there working and I'd be taking it easy, amen. <laughs> Now, she said, not only are we in debt, but my boys are about to be sold and my husband is dead and I don't have anything. There's nothing left. But the Bible says that when she said that, it is almost like God turned a light switch on in her mind. This is the quote. Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, comma, And then it's like she remembered, save a pot of oil. She said, I don't have anything. I don't have a husband. My boys are being sold into slavery. I'm worse than having nothing. I'm in debt. I'm in negative nothing. Anybody else know what she's talking about? And I don't have anything except for a pot of oil. The man of God said, you said you had nothing, but you're wrong because what you saw is nothing, God still sees it as something. And the man of God said, go to your neighbors and get every vessel you can find. You get gallon jugs, you get five gallon buckets. If anybody's got a 50 gallon drum, you get those. You bring them into the house. And he said, I want you to take that little pot of oil and I want you to begin to pour into those other vessels. And as she did, watch now, that little pot that she thought was nothing, it never dried up. And she filled up the gallon jugs, and then she filled up the five gallon buckets, and then she filled up the 50 gallon drums. 
Every vessel was filled to overflowing. Then the man of God said, take the oil in all the vessels and sell it. Look at me right here. God took a widow in debt and in one day made an oil tycoon out of her. She's in the oil business. And God not only met her need, but Elisha said, go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, listen, and live thou and thy children of the rest. She not only got out of debt, she got a retirement plan. And not only did she get a retirement plan, her sons got a living and an income off of the oil that God had produced. She thought she had nothing, but when she saw what she did have, God made it more than enough. She could have died looking at what she didn't have. She could have died mourning the loss of her sons in slavery and her husband in the grave. But thank God she quit focusing on what had been lost and she started investing in what was left. And when you can get over what's lost and you can get involved in what's left, you're giving God something to bless. I know I'm yelling, but I'm yelling on purpose. I'm excited this morning. Because I look around and I see folk in this building that the devil tells you, you've got nothing left. You don't have anything to give God. Your better days are behind you. You'll never experience life like you used to. I want you to hear me and hear me well. The devil is a liar. Quit looking at what you lost and thank God for what's left. (laughs) I don't know if they had limousines in that day, but I'd have went and bought me a limousine chariot. Somebody help me right there. I mean stretched. And if I'd have been her, I'd have rode down to the cemetery and looked over at that gravestone where that husband was and say, can you believe that God, (laughs) that God could take us when we were at the end of everything and we thought it was nothing and he gave us more in our loss than we ever had when we was doing it ourselves. You realize that all of us at times, can be tempted to get so caught up in what we don't have that we look right past what we do have. This March, March the 17th, will be 19 years that God's let me preach behind this pulpit. And a a year and a half into the life of this church, I was 23, 24 years old and immature, no idea what I was doing. If you buy a book on how to start a church, I did everything the opposite of what that book tells you to do. And about a year and a half into it, we just went down to nothing. I mean, just a handful was left. And I remember coming in on those Sundays and on those Thursdays and just so frustrated, so aggravated. I mean, just a handful of people. And I remember thinking, God, we've lost it all. But I had a sweet sister, Miss Martha Burris, that would not let me quit. And she would not let me walk away. She said, preacher, did God call you here? I said, he sure did. She said, has God told you to leave? I said, not yet. She said, then you don't have any say in the matter. And boy, she just kept fanning the flame in my heart. She kept believing in me. She kept pushing me. And we had just a handful that was left. But I want you to look at what God has done with a handful that was left when he puts his touch on it. I, not too awfully long ago, have some precious friends. I had two sons. And one of their sons died tragically, unexpectedly, and just horribly how he left this world. They grieved and we grieved and they wept and their friends wept with them. And as I watched them grieving over the loss of that boy, I sat down with them one day and I said, I 
feel impressed to tell you this. And I don't understand anything about what you're going through. I don't pretend to know the level of grief that you're experiencing. But the Lord wanted me to tell you that if you're not careful, you will grieve the one that is lost to the point that you'll lose the one that is left. And I don't pretend to understand the sorrow of a parent's heart that's lost a child. But I watched them grieve and I watched them weep and as they wept and wept over the one that was gone, the one that remained got pushed further and further away. And I watched him shut down emotionally and I watched him shut down spiritually and I watched him begin to pursue other avenues in life. Can you imagine being second place to somebody that's not even here all of your life? They grieved the one that was gone until they lost the one that they had. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to this little country preacher. We have all experienced losses in life. We have all had people walk away from us that we thought would stand beside us. But if you're not careful, you'll stand so angry and you'll be watching those that left that you'll fail to see that God has kept some good ones around you. Divorce will come and break up the home and it's over and it's through and she's that way and he's that way. But if you're not careful, you'll be so bitter at that spouse that left that you'll look right over the children that are still here. And that bitterness in your heart toward them will corrupt those children that God still has in your life. And by grieving that which is gone, you're destroying that which still is. I've talked to men in their late 50s and early 60s who lost a job that they had worked at 25, 30 years. And they're so bitter, and they're so angry, and they're so twisted because they gave three decades to a company that cut them when the budget tightened up and they're so mad that they lost their job and while they're angry about a job, they're looking right past a loving wife, beautiful children, a home, their health, and all of that doesn't matter because they are focusing on what they lost and not what is left. You must come to a place where you decide that you cannot change that which is gone, but you can invest in that which is still here. Oh, that's right. Give the Lord a good praise. If you know that's right, it is an easy place to get to where we look at what we don't have and we forget about what we do have. I've been there financially. I... When we started the church, I was 23. I'm telling you, I was so full of wisdom, I I wish I was still that smart. I had the answer to everybody's problems. We were trying to get this church off the ground. We poured every dime we had into it. And I got upside down financially. And I know what it's like to go to sleep at night with ulcers in my mouth and ulcers in my stomach, thinking about bills that I can't pay make you sick to check an email or go to, the, go to the mailbox, flipped upside down. And I have no doubt that there are some here this morning in that boat. You have gotten out of line financially and it's crushing you physically. It is crushing you spiritually. It's hurting your home. It's affecting the lives of your children. There's some that even have had suicidal thoughts over financial difficulty. But I want you to listen to me and I want you to hear the voice of God through the word of God. You don't have to die there. You've got something left. (laughs) Pay your debt down. Get another job. Do what you have to do. Get that credit score up. You do what you can and let God do the rest. Don't die in a place of despair. There's still life on the other side of your mistakes. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, everybody wants to hear something deep and spiritual, but you can't even hear nothing deep and spiritual if your basic life choices have got you stretched so thin that you don't even know what the voice of God sounds like. And I've been there. I've been there. 
bad choices, financial mistakes. And I've watched God, I've watched God flip my situation. And I'm not wealthy, I'm not. I, I mean, I don't have much, but praise God, I'll tell you how rich I am. I can go to Waffle House, get that all-star, not even worry about it, just put it on my car. And that's pretty good, ain't it? But I remember days when I couldn't. I, I, I've been there where, where you don't pick them groceries up until you see approved on the scanner. Come on, somebody. You may not be taking that home with you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? God can fix that. You've got something left. Now, it's easy to look at what we don't have. I remember the story. Come on, Brother Jerry, I'm done. I remember the story in Luke chapter 10 of the good Samaritan. The Bible tells us that a certain man fell among thieves. Anybody ever feel like that in life? He fell among thieves and they robbed him and they beat him and they threw him in the ditch and left him to die. And this is what the Bible says. It says that he was left, listen, half dead. Y'all hearing me? Half dead. A priest came by that way and when the priest saw him, he looked down his long, self-righteous, religious nose and he saw a bloody, beaten man laying in the ditch and the priest went to the other side of the road and kept on walking. I can't be bothered with him. A Levite comes by, sees him laying in the ditch, bloody and beaten and robbed. The Levite saw him as half dead and he took his ecclesiastical heritage to the other side of the road and said, I can't bother with somebody like that. He'll contaminate my holiness. But then the Bible says that a Samaritan came by. And when that Samaritan saw him in the ditch, he did not see him as half dead. He saw him as half alive. (laughs) Everybody else thought he was half dead. But the Samaritan said, glory, He's half alive. And I know this morning that some of you in here, you feel half dead. You look in the mirror and emotionally, life has left you half dead. You've got a marriage that everybody on the outside thinks is wonderful, but on the inside, you feel like it's half dead. Your hopes for your children are half dead. Your financial dreams are half dead. You crawl into the house of God and crawl back out because spiritually you're half dead. But I've come to speak life into your dry soul and tell you, you're not half dead. Thank God you're half alive. (laughs) Get up out of the grave. You're not dead yet. We're not gonna cover you up. It ain't over. You're not half dead. You're half alive. And when you look at what you have left and you forget about what you lost and you begin to pour your life into what was left, God can make it more than what you ever had before. There's folk here this morning. Your relationship with your grown children, you feel like it's half dead. It's half alive. They're breaking your heart. Find that common ground. Love them unconditionally. Don't give up on that God-built relationship. It's half alive. (laughs) I'm trying to tell somebody this morning that you can spend life looking back on what was and mad about it. Or you can rejoice on what is and say, Lord, it ain't much, but it's yours. And I give it to you. And I'm going to strengthen the things which remain.